Good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining today's session on the DFS Cybersecurity Regulation Second Amendment 23 NYC RR Part 500. Upon your entry to this webinar, your lines have all been muted. And due to the large volume of attendees, we will not have a live Q&A session today. But we'd like to thank all the participants who submitted questions in advance of the session, and we will try to answer all that we can while we're here. So we encourage you to visit the Cybersecurity Resource Center, and that address is https colon backslash backslash www.dfs dot ny dot gov slash industry underscore guidance slash cybersecurity. There you'll see lots of information on part 500, including some FAQs. You can also sign up for email updates related to cybersecurity in the financial services sector by going to the DFS email update sign up page on the web at https colon backslash backslash public dot gov delivery dot com slash accounts slash nydfs slash subscriber slash new so i'd like to introduce you to our presenters today for the session and we have harriet pearson who is the executive deputy superintendent and head of the cybersecurity division and we also have joanne berman who's the deputy superintendent of legal and policy for the cybersecurity division. And so now I'd like to turn it over to Harriet to get us started today. Thank you very much. And let me add my welcome uh, and thanks to you for joining this session on the recently published amendment to DFS's cybersecurity regulation, otherwise known as part 500. Uh, my name is Harriet Pearson. Um, earlier this year, I joined DFS to lead the cybersecurity division, which is responsible for the Part 500 regulation and for providing DFS-wide leadership in supervision, compliance, and policy matters in this area. Uh, previously, uh, for a decade, I was a partner and senior counsel in the law firm based in New York and Washington, D.C., uh, where I founded and led the firm cybersecurity practice. And prior to that, for a couple of decades, I uh, was security counsel and privacy officer at a large technology firm. Um, joining me uh, to present today's session is the cybersecurity division's chief counsel and deputy superintendent for law and policy, Joanne Berman. Uh, Joanne has led the amendment process from start to end, and there is no one closer to this regulation than she is. Um, our objective in today's webinar is to provide you with an overview of the changes to uh, the cybersecurity regulation that were public that was published on November 1 of this year, uh, and which takes effect, uh, various requirements in it take effect over the next 24 months. As noted, um, due to the size of the attendance here, uh, we have gathered questions in advance. We will attempt to answer as many as possible within the content here, and uh, we'll provide you additional information about resources available uh, at the end of the at the end of the session. Um, so first, uh, let me uh, let me cover a little bit of background uh, on the history and need for the regulation and the process followed to amend it. And then Joanne will cover what's changed and some key compliance dates. Um, so uh, if we go to the next slide, please. Um, first, a little bit of background. Um, uh, as uh, some of you may know, some of or ma many of you may know, um, all, DFS was the first financial services regulator in the United States, um, if not the world actually, to adopt a comprehensive cybersecurity regulation of private, private sector entities uh, back in 2017. Um, there was, and unfortunately there continues to be, very good reason for requiring financial services companies to protect themselves. Um, that's because the sector is a significant target of cyber threats, whether bad actors are motivated by the money they can steal or the disruption they can create. Um, just as an example, in the last 18 months uh, ending June 30, 
of this year, cyber attacks against financial services providers increased 65%, uh, or from about 4.5 billion to 9 billion attacks, according to Akamai. And of the estimated uh, 3.75 billion online attacks on web apps and APIs globally in the first half of 2022, the United States financial services sector accounts for more than a billion attacks. And given the number of financial services businesses in New York State and the importance of the sector and the volume of data it handles, it means that it's even more important for cyber risk to be well managed in New York State. Um, that's uh, that's a contact context for the reason for uh, regulating regulating in this area. And uh, what is also noteworthy as background is that New York's um, first step and the leadership step in 2017 was ultimately followed uh, by other states and at the federal level. Um, for example, 22 states have adopted the National Association of Insurance Commissioners Cybersecurity Model Law, which itself was modeled after Part 500. And in June of this year, the Federal Trade Commission's updates to its safeguard rule uh, which were modeled after Part 500, uh, took effect for non-bank financial services companies such as mortgage brokers, motor vehicle dealers, and payday lenders. So um, that's uh, that's background from 2017 to today in terms of uh, the need for the regulation and the uh, New York's uh, leadership step in 2017 and, and others who have followed. If we go to the next slide, another piece of background that um, uh, we have found valuable to cover is to actually address uh, who is covered uh, by uh, the DFS cybersecurity regulation. Um, a unique aspect of our regulation, Part 500, is its broad applicability to substantially all of DFS's regulated entities, from small to large, with multiple business models. Uh, ultimately, this broad applicability makes sense. Every type of entity is vulnerable to cyber threats and uh, must take action to protect themselves. Um, now, within the context, we'll be talking a little bit later about tailoring the requirements to different types of entities, but ultimately the, the following general principle is, principle is true. If an entity or individual is licensed or otherwise approved to operate in New York State by DFS, uh, they need to take some combination of actions under Part 500 to manage cyber risk in order to protect themselves and the consumer and customer data they handle. Now, um, in terms of uh, the amendment process, um, as I said, the uh, regulation was initially adopted in 2017, and I'd like to cover um, uh, just a bit about the process DFS took to um, amend uh, the regulation. First and foremost, I'll, I'll, I'll start with the data-driven uh, approach that DFS took to, uh, even before starting the amendment process, implementing the regulation. A lot of work to uh, research and understand uh, and uh, assess the landscape and then um, uh, insights derived from that. So over the past five years, DFS did receive information from multiple sources and activities. The agency, uh, examined uh, the cybersecurity programs of regulated entities and how they responded to incidents and uh, cybersecurity events that were reported. Uh, the agency uh, analyzed new market developments and, and cyber threat uh, landscape developments and issued alerts and guidance uh, in the face of evolving threats. The agency also consulted with cybersecurity experts and industry groups about emerging trends and practices uh, and also conducted research on regulatory framework standards and rules and other regulations. When DFS looked at the data and analyzed it, a few things became crystal clear. Um, most of the incidents, the cybersecurity incidents or events that we learned about, that the agency learned about, involved uh, cyber criminals using the same techniques repeatedly over and over again. Um, and in that context, uh, companies can do, organizations can do a lot to protect themselves from, from those kinds of attacks. Um, and the way that organizations can protect themselves is to use controls that by now have become industry standard. And these, uh, as we'll talk about, controls and measures uh, were uh, those uh, that have become now industry standards and suitable to be incorporated in Part 500 in an appropriate way. 
Um, so that was at least the first step in terms of gathering data. And then with respect to the decision to amend the regulation, if we can go to the next slide, yes, uh, the decision became pretty clear uh, overall uh, because of the amount of change in the landscape. This is a fast moving area. A lot has changed since the regulation first went into effect in 2017. Um, and uh, first, consider how differently companies operate today. Um, Post-COVID, workforces are more distributed. Uh, in the financial services sector, consider the influx of new types of businesses and all of the digital initiatives underway, even in traditional financial services businesses. Even as these initiatives and changes increase efficiency and service levels, they also increase the attack surface that can be taken advantage of by bad actors. Uh, secondly, bad actors continue to multiply and to become more sophisticated and bold. This is unfortunate, but it's also quite true. I'm sure you've heard of ransomware. Um, you, we know there's a whole industry devoted to helping criminals commit ransomware attacks and similar kinds of attacks. Uh, another example for is a supply chain attack, such as the recent Move It incident in which a criminal organization compromised a commonly used file transfer software product uh, and with about a third of environments running vulnerable MoveIt servers uh, at the time the mass hacks began belonged to financial services related organizations, um, that's a significant challenge. Uh, and uh, we know, according to an internet analysis firm Census, that over 80% of the organizations impacted were, have been in the United States, according to another firm, and many millions of consumers' data has been compromised. Um, so. Uh, the the threats and the way they, the threats impact changing organizations uh, clearly fed into uh, the thinking around what else needs to be done here with Part 500. And finally, and related to the data uh, collected uh, that I discussed, it, there are more te techniques and tools that can, at reasonable cost, reduce the chance that a cyber attack will be successful against a specific entity. Um, an example is multi-factor authentication, uh, which is now inexpensive and relatively straightforward technique to protect systems from initial unauthorized access. Um, and you'll hear a little bit more about that later and how it now reflects in Part 500's requirements. Another example is not even a technology. It's now an industry standard practice for boards of directors to regularly get briefed by management about cybersecurity so that the board in its oversight capacity can help ensure that appropriate resources are devoted to the effort to protect against cyber threats. Um, so uh, with all of that, amending part 500, the decision to do it, and then the approach going forward was a key, a key focus was to ensure that the regulations requirements continue to incorporate current practices that are known to be effective in this area. Um, if we go to the next slide, the process used to um, amend uh, now the regulation was, uh, you know, keeping with the data-driven approach uh, was thorough uh, and open. And it began really even before the decision was made to amend by engaging doing the research, issuing guidance. Um, for example, you'll see on the screen here several examples, guidance on ransomware, on multi-factor authentication, and other topics over the, the few years preceding the start of the formal rulemaking process. If we go to the next slide, uh, the timeline for the, um, the, the process that began formally uh, was a pre-proposal published on the DFS website in July of 22. Uh, that received multiple comments. Uh, later in 2022, in November, the first proposal was established, was published in the state register, uh, received, again, uh, hundreds of comments. And in June of this year, the revised proposal was published and received uh, more than 300 comments. Um, I can assure you that the co each comment was reviewed and addressed, and um, DFS regularly communicated about the process underway. Uh, publicly to promote engagement. And of course, uh, we're here today providing this webinar because on November 1 of 2023, the final amended regulation was published and uh, became effective. Um, before I turn it over to Joanne to now describe the changes in Part 500, let me just uh, finish this portion by emphasizing uh, something that did not change. 
Um, the most important characteristic of Part 500 or the cybersecurity regulation is that it is risk-based. The core requirement uh, of the regulation is for covered entities to have governance in place such that they identify, evaluate, and then address cybersecurity risks to their business by implementing a program that is tailored to their unique risk profile. Inherently, this approach is flexible, does not specify specific technologies, and it allows for a great deal of judgment on the part of the covered entity. Uh, this approach has proven durable and has been in place since 2017. Um, and most of the changes that have been made to Part 500 now add to the kind of governance and process or procedural steps that by now are recommended and considered standard within industry. So we, the regulation emphasizes governance and process, and uh, that approach remains the same. Um, and I, uh, I conclude now by, uh, by turning it over to Joanne Berman to now take us through um, what uh, has changed in the regulation. Joanne? Thank you, Harriet, and good morning, everyone. As Harriet just noted, the general approach in the cybersecurity regulation has not changed. However, there are a number of key substantive changes, which I'm going to review now. One of the biggest changes is that the amendment increased the department's ability to tailor cybersecurity requirements to different sizes and types of organizations. These tailored requirements are based on DFS regulated entities risks and resources. The amendment adds new requirements for the largest DFS companies updates the qualifications needed for smaller DFS regulated entities to be exempt from some of the regulations requirements and adds specific types of businesses and individual licensees that will be exempt from all of the regulations requirements. Next slide, please. As Harriet also explained earlier, the regulation applies to almost all entities and individuals regulated by DFS. They are defined in the cybersecurity regulation as covered entities. Since its promulgation in 2017, the regulation has essentially broken out covered entities into two categories. One consists of exempt entities, which typically are smaller companies and individual licensees, and the other consists of the rest. But because DFS regulates such a wide variety of organizations, DFS added a third category of covered entity so that the requirements could be better tailored to the different sizes and types of DFS regulated individuals and businesses. This new category is made up of the largest DFS regulated businesses. They are defined in the regulation as class A companies. This means that now a covered entity will fall into one of three buckets, class A, exempt, or those that don't qualify as class A or exempt, which for days, for today's purposes will be referred to as standard. Each category has its own set of requirements. Large class A companies have to comply with all of the regulations requirements. Standard companies have to comply with most and smaller exempt covered entities either don't have to comply with any requirements or they only have to comply with some. So let's start by discussing the newly created category class A companies. These companies are defined as covered entities that, one, have at least 20 million in gross annual revenue in each of the last two years from all business operations of the covered entity and the New York business operations of its affiliates, and two, either have over 2,000 employees, including employees of both the covered entity and all of its affiliates, averaged over the last two years, or over 1 billion in gross annual revenue in each of the last two years from all business operations of the covered entity and all of its affiliates. To determine whether a company meets these requirements when calculating the number of employees and gross annual revenue, covered entities only have to include those affiliates that share information systems, cybersecurity resources, or all or any part of a cybersecurity program with the covered entity. The reason for limiting what counts as an affiliate here is that DFS is concerned with protecting access to a covered entity's non-public information. 
when a covered entity's non-public information is maintained on systems that are connected to those of other entities, it jeopardizes the non-public information of our covered entities. Because if there is a breach at one of the other entities, the threat actor may be able to access the covered entity's non-public information. That cannot happen if the resources are not shared. Since these larger entities have more employees, more revenue, more customers, and more data, they have more cyber risk in general. Therefore, the amended regulation requires more of them. Class A companies likely will already have these additional requirements in place as they are industry standard practices for large financial services organizations. The new requirements are designing and conducting independent audits of their cybersecurity programs, monitoring privileged access activity and implementing a privileged access management solution, an automated method of blocking commonly used passwords, an endpoint detection and response solution to monitor anomalous activity, and a centralized logging and security event alert solution. There is some leeway for Class A companies in implementing these requirements. For example, Class A companies are able to determine the scope and the number of independent audits of their cybersecurity programs, although the scope and number must be reasonably based on findings in their risk assessments. Moreover, for some of the requirements, Class A companies will be able to use reasonably equivalent or more secure compensating controls as long as their chief information security officers or CISOs approve of their use in writing. The second category consists of exempt covered entities. There have always been since 2017 and there still are two types of exemptions, full and limited. While these two types of exemptions remain in the amended regulation, there are changes to the qualifications for both. With respect to full exemptions, if a covered entity met the qualifications for a full exemption prior to the amendment, that covered entity still qualifies to be fully exempt. The only change in the amendment in this regard is that more types of covered entities qualify for full exemptions. Covered entities that have and still qualify for full exemptions are very specific types of entities, such as charitable annuity societies, non-New York chartered risk retention groups, and accredited reinsurers or certified reinsurers, and individual licensees who are, one, employed by another DFS-regulated company, and two, whose business is covered by the cybersecurity program of that DFS regulated employer. This exemption generally includes full time employees of a DFS regulated company. As of November 1st, the following additional covered entities qualified for full exemptions. Wholly owned subsidiaries that use the cybersecurity program of their parent, if that parent is also regulated by DFS, I want to emphasize that's for wholly owned subsidiaries, not 99% owned. Inactive individual insurance brokers, agents, and licensed mortgage loan officers, and reciprocal jurisdiction reinsurers. Besides changes to those who are fully exempt from the regulations requirements, there are changes to those who will be exempt from some of the regulations requirements. Covered entities that have and still qualify for limited exemptions are those that do not have information systems and do not maintain non-public information, captive insurance companies that do not and are not required to maintain non-public information, and certain small businesses. There are no changes to the first two categories because they apply to covered entities that do not maintain non-public information. As a result, there is no reason to require cybersecurity controls as there is no data to protect. It is already in the public domain. The covered entities in these two categories are exempt from, re from the requirements of 12 sections of the regulation. With respect to the third category, small businesses, there has been a change to the qualifications. Previously, to qualify for a small business limited exemption, a covered entity had to have less than 10 employees and independent contractors, including those of its affiliates located in New York or responsible for the business of the covered entity, or 
$5 million in gross annual revenue from the New York business operations of the covered entity and its affiliates, or $10 million in year-end total assets, including those of affiliates. As of November 1st, a covered entity is eligible for a small business exemption if it meets one of the following three criteria. You only need to meet one. The number of its employees and independent contractors and the number of its affiliates, employees, and independent contractors is less than 20. It no longer matters where they are located or whether they are responsible for the business of the covered entity. Again, it's the number of employees and independent contractors and the number of its affiliates, employees, and independent contractors that has to be less than 20 to meet this, this uh, criteria. Second criteria you could meet is if your gross annual revenue and the gross annual revenue from the New York business operations of your affiliates is less than seven and a half million dollars. The revenue of the covered entity is no longer just of its New York business operations. It is all, it includes the revenue of all of the operations from the covered entity. The third criteria you could meet is if your year end assets and those of your affiliates total less than $15 million. This exemption is meant for small businesses, not for small branches of larger companies. Given questions received by DFS in the past and more recently, this has been a source of confusion. So I wanna emphasize again that this exemption is meant for small businesses, not for small branches of larger companies. This should be clear because part 500 defines affiliate very broadly to include pretty much all related companies and covered entities must include all of their affiliates, employees and independent contractors, gross annual revenue from New York business operations and year end assets when calculating the numbers that determine eligibility for the small business limited exemption. There is another change to this exemption, but it will not kick in for about a year. Currently, entities that qualify for the small business limited exemption are exempt from nine sections of the regulation. However, on November 1st, 2024, these covered entities will no longer be exempt from the MFA requirements, multi-factor authentication requirements, and the requirement to conduct cybersecurity awareness training for all personnel. We will discuss those requirements in more detail later today. The third bucket or category a covered entity can fall into is the standard one. This is the category that most DFS regulated businesses, as opposed to individual licensees, will fall into. These covered entities will have to comply with all of the requirements except for the six previously mentioned that are only required of Class A companies. You'll learn more about those requirements as we go through the rest of the presentation. Next slide, please. The purpose of this next section is to provide you with a general overview at a high level of the key requirements and their effective dates. We are not going to walk through every section because the requirements in the amended regulation are going to phase in over the next two years. After the overview, we will go into more detail on the requirements that kick in over the next six months. That said, this will not be the last training DFS will offer. We plan to go over more of the requirements in greater detail as their effective dates get closer. We will also be sending email reminders before the requirements become effective. You should all have already received the first reminder email. If not, please sign up for cybersecurity related emails on the department's cybersecurity resource center. As stated, the changes will occur in phases over a two year period. This timeline shows effective dates for the key substantive requirements. There are also three timelines available on the Cybersecurity Resource Center, one for each category of class of covered entity, Class A, exempt, and standard. We are going to go into a bit more detail and review each key substantive change, which category of covered entity must comply with each of them, and when they go into effect. To start, the new scope of exempt entities that we just discussed is now in effect. That means that covered entities qualifying under the expanded parameters of the amended regulation for both full and limited exemptions are entitled to the benefits of the exemption for which they qualify as of today. 
on November 1st, the new notification requirements kicked in. While covered entities still have to notify DFS about certain types of cybersecurity incidents, they will also have to notify DFS if a ransomware, if ransomware has been deployed on a material part of their information systems, and if an extortion payment has been made. On April 15th, as was the case every April 15th since 2020, covered entities will have to submit a notification regarding their compliance with Part 500 for the previous calendar year. Under the 2017 version of the cybersecurity regulation, covered entities had to submit a certification of compliance that was signed by the chair of the board or the senior officer in charge of cybersecurity. In 2024, however, covered entities will have the option of submitting a certification of material compliance or an acknowledgement of non-compliance. And the annual submission must be signed by the highest ranking executive at the covered entity and its CISO, or if the covered entity doesn't have a CISO, the senior officer in charge of its cybersecurity program. For these submissions, you only need to determine your compliance with the sections that are effective as of April 15th, 2024. That means the only new requirement you will need to consider for this coming April is the notification requirement just discussed, which will be irrelevant unless you suffer a cybersecurity incident this month, this December 2023. In addition, those qualifying for a limited exemption only have to consider whether they are in compliance with the sections applicable to them. We're going to go into more detail about what is required in the cybersecurity incident and annual notification, um, annual compliance notifications after reviewing the rest of the timeline. Most of the new requirements will become effective in about six months on April 29th, 2024. There are two significant ones that apply to all covered entities except those that are fully exempt. The first has to do with risk assessments. Since the cybersecurity regulation was first promulgated, covered entities' cybersecurity programs had to be based on risk assessments. This has not changed. What has changed is that covered entities had to conduct risk assessments periodically, and now they will have to be reviewed and updated at least annually, and whenever a change in business or technology causes a material change to the, cyber, to the covered entity's cyber risk. The second new requirement that limited exempt standard and class A covered entities will have to comply with by April 29th, 2024 has to do with cybersecurity policies. Implementing and maintaining cybersecurity policies have also always been required by the regulation. This too will not change. The amendment, however, adds areas that must be addressed in the policies. We will discuss those areas in more detail later in the presentation. The other requirement shown on this slide has to do with cybersecurity awareness training. Well, this continues to be required for all personnel starting on April 29, 2024, standard and class A covered entities will be required to provide training that includes social engineering and is conducted at least annually. The reason this was added is because as reported by the Department of Homeland Security, the FBI and the National Security Agency, more than 90% of all cyber attacks begin with phishing, which is a form of social engineering. So, training employees on how to spot, avoid, and report phishing attacks has become a key cyber hygiene measure that must be in place. Another significant change that will become effective on April 29, 2024, has to do with requirements related to vulnerability management. This is a more technical requirement that still will not be required for any fully or limited exempt covered entity, but will be required for both standard and class A companies. To understand what is required here, you must understand that a vulnerability is a weakness in an information system or other valuable asset that can be exploited by threat actors. For example, when a company has secure doors that require their employees to enter a code or swipe a badge to open, 
A vulnerability exists if the door is propped open and unauthorized individuals are able to enter the secure space. Since 2017, non-exempt covered entities have been required to conduct two kinds of testing to their information systems. One is annual penetration testing, which is an authorized simulated attack performed on a computer system to evaluate its security and determine if there are any vulnerabilities. And two, uh, biannual vulnerability assessments, which are essentially tests to identify existing gaps in cybersecurity programs. As of April 29th, 2024, non-exempt covered entities will have to conduct annual penetration from both inside and outside the information systems boundaries, have a monitoring process in place that will promptly inform them of new security vulnerabilities, and timely prioritize and remediate known and identified vulnerabilities. Finally, Class A companies' first additional action will be required by April 29, 2024, at which point they will have to design and conduct independent audits of their cybersecurity programs. The scope and number of audits, as well as their frequency, is up to the Class A company, but must be based on its risk assessment. The next important date in the timeline for compliance is November 1st, 2024. Two of the requirements that become effective on November 1st, 2024 will apply only to covered entities that qualify for the small business limited exemption. As previously stated, those covered entities are going to have to comply with the requirements in two more sections of part 500. The first is the section titled multi-factor authentication. We're going to discuss MFA in more detail later in this presentation. The second section small businesses will need to comply with is one we have discussed previously, cybersecurity awareness training for all personnel. Cybersecurity awareness training has only been required for standard companies in the past. As of November 1st, 2024, it will also be required for small businesses. This requirement was added for small businesses because as stated previously, phishing accounts for 90% of initial unauthorized access. Moreover, threat actors use phishing and other social engineering techniques on everyone, not just employees at medium and large sized companies. Awareness training is also a lower cost control that has a high impact on reducing the risk of a successful cyber attack. Next, and also by November 1st, 2024, Standard and Class A covered entities will have to comply with new encryption requirements. Again, these covered entities have had to use encryption to protect non-public information at rest and in transit since the cybersecurity regulation was promulgated in 2017. This will not change. However, as of November 1st, 2024, they will also need to have written policies requiring encryption that meets industry standards. Additionally, they still will be able to use effective alternate compensating controls for non-public information at rest, as long as they have been reviewed and approved by their CISO in writing, but they will no longer have the option to use effective alternative compensating controls for encryption of NPI in transit over external networks. <clears throat> Another significant change that will become effective on November 1st, 2024, is that DFS is going to require more in terms of cybersecurity governance. What this means is that there will be more required of chief information security officers, senior management, and boards with respect to cybersecurity, and that they will be accountable for ensuring their company's cybersecurity program complies with Part 500. The additional governance requirements align with what we understand to be standard industry practice regarding oversight. There will be two additional requirements for CISOs. One, their required annual written reports will have to include plans for remediating material inadequacies. And two, CISOs will be required to timely report on material cybersecurity issues to the senior governing body or a senior officer. There will also be new requirements for senior governing bodies. 
senior governing bodies can be a board of directors or a board of managers, or if neither of those exist, the senior officer responsible for cybersecurity at the covered entity. The overall new requirement for senior governing bodies is that they will be responsible for exercising oversight of the covered entity's cybersecurity risk management. They are going to explicitly be required to have sufficient understanding of cybersecurity related matters, review management reports about cybersecurity, direct management and senior uh, officers to create an effective cybersecurity program and ensure management has allocated sufficient resources to be able to implement and maintain that effective cybersecurity program. Notably, small businesses are exempt from these requirements. The final key change that will become effective on November 1st, 2024 has to do with incident response and business continuity and disaster recovery plans. Since 2017, standard and class A companies have been required to have incident response and business continuity and disaster recovery policies and procedures in place. There have also been specific requirements for incident response plans, but there were never any specific requirements for the business continuity and disaster recovery plans. Covered entities will still be required to implement and maintain incident response plans as of November 1st, 2024, but the amendment requires that they be updated to include three more areas, recovery from backups, revising incident response plans as necessary, and preparing a root cause analysis that describes how and why a cybersecurity event occurred, what business impact it had, and what will be done to prevent reoccurrence. The amendment further requires covered entities to have business continuity and disaster recovery plans that are reasonably designed to address a cybersecurity related disruption, specific requirements regarding what must be included in the BCDR plan can be found in section 516. There are also new requirements for both types of plans, such as training all employees involved in plan implementation, testing plans with critical staff, revising plans as necessary, testing the ability to restore critical data and information systems for backups, and maintaining and adequately protecting backups that are necessary to restore material operations. The next phase in date for implementation of the amended regulation is May 1st, 2025. There are four sections that become effective at that time. The first one, that we are going to discuss applies to almost all covered entities, including those that qualify for the small business limited exemption. It is section 500.7, which contains requirements for access privileges and management. Access privileges has to do with how much information your employees and other authorized users of your network can see and manipulate. Since the regulation was promulgated in 2017, there have been requirements regarding access privileges. However, as of May 1st, 2025, in about 18 months, there will be more requirements as DFS seeks to ensure covered entities implement the principle of least privileged access, which essentially means that each user should be given the minimum level of access necessary to perform their job. To implement that principle, Covered entities will be required to enhance their requirements, limiting information and systems users access, review access privileges and remove or disable accounts and access that are no longer necessary, promptly terminate access following personnel departures, implement a reasonable written password policy, and disable or securely configure all protocols that permit remote control of devices. Covered entities will also be required to implement a password policy that meets the current industry standard at that time. All of these new requirements stem from lessons learned by investigating hundreds of cybersecurity events that have been reported to DFS, as well as industry trends and numerous discussions with cybersecurity experts regarding the most cost effective and easiest controls to put in place. Two other sections that will kick in on May 1st, 2025 are technical ones that apply only to standard and class A companies. First, section 500.5A2 will require covered entities to conduct automated scans 
of information systems and manual review of systems not covered by scans to discover, analyze, and report vulnerabilities at a frequency determined by their risk assessment and promptly after any material system changed. The second kind of technical control that standard and Class A companies will be required to implement by May 1st, 2025 is one that relates to malicious code. Malicious code or malware is a tool used by cyber criminals to disrupt computer operations, steal sensitive information, and gain access to an organization's computer systems. Malicious code can masquerade as free software or be embedded in programs you activate. Malware can also be introduced into your organization by visiting and clicking on links on websites and through email. The amendment requires covered entities, therefore, to implement controls that are designed to protect against malicious code, including those that monitor and filter web traffic and email to block malicious content. The final new requirement that will become effective in 18 months only applies to Class A companies. They will have until May 1st, 2025 to implement an endpoint and detection, an endpoint detection and response solution that monitors anomalous activity and a centralized logging and security event alert solution. The amendment does permit Class A companies to use reasonably equivalent or more secure compensating controls as long as their CISO approves and puts that approval in writing. The last of the phase in dates is November 1st, 2025, two years after the effective date of the regulation the re of the amendment. The amendment provides this two year implementation period for only two sections of the regulation. The first provides rules regarding multi-factor authentication. It will require standard and class A companies to use multi-factor authentication for all individuals accessing any of a covered entity's information systems. Because multi-factor authentication is so important, as I've said, we're gonna spend some time discussing it in more detail later, even though the requirements won't kick in for a year if you're um, a small business limited exempt covered entity or two years if you're a class A or standard company. The second section with the longest phase in period is 500.13a, which lays out specific requirements related to asset inventories. Covered entities have always been required to have a policy that addresses asset inventories, but there were no specific requirements concerning the inventories. As of November 1st, 2025, all covered entities except those that are fully exempt will be required to implement not only a policy, but also procedures that are designed to produce and maintain a complete, accurate, and documented asset inventory of the covered entity's information systems. The policy and procedures must include a method to track specified key information for each asset, including information about the owner and location of an asset, and the frequency required to update and validate its asset inventory. We're now going to take a deeper dive into certain requirements that I mentioned before. You already saw that as of November 1st, oh, which already occurred, <laughs> there were new reporting requirements regarding cybersecurity incidents for all covered entities aside from those that are fully exempt. They are going to be required to notify DFS of a couple of new types of cybersecurity incidents. Next slide, please. Um, since its promulgation, the regulation has required covered entities to report certain cybersecurity events to DFS within 72 hours of determining that a reportable event has occurred. Reportable events are those that either have a reasonable likelihood of materially harming any material part of the normal operation of the covered entity and impact the covered entity. It doesn't have to be both, but these are two types of reportable events. And the second type is that those that impact the covered entity and require notification to another government body, self-regulatory agency, or any other supervisory body. It is very important to note that 
when another government body has to be notified. The requirement to notify DFS kicks in whether or not the data that was exposed involved that of a New Yorker. DFS is concerned about a breach of a covered entity's information systems, which is why the requirement is there. And this requirement remains in the amended regulation. As of December 1st, covered entities will also be, have also been required to notify DFS of cybersecurity events that result in the deployment of ransomware within a material part of the covered entity's information systems. Furthermore, covered entities will be required to report such events, whether they occur at the covered entity itself, an affiliate or a third party service provider. And they will be required to promptly provide DFS any information requested regarding the event, as well as update DFS with material changes or new information that was previously unavailable. This has already been required and has already been going on. We just codified it in the regulation. The other notifications regarding cybersecurity incidents that DFS requires covered entities to provide have to do with ransomware payments. If a covered entity makes a ransom payment, it will have to notify DFS within 24 hours of the payment. Then, within 30 days of the payment, covered entities will have to provide DFS with a written description of the reasons payment was necessary, the alternatives to payment considered, and diligence performed to find alternatives to payment and to ensure compliance with applicable regulations, including those of the Office of Foreign Asset Control. Let me be clear, though, DFS continues to discourage making extortion payments. Reporting of cybersecurity events and extortion payments should still be submitted online through the DFS portal. There is a link to the portal as well as detailed instructions on how to submit a notice on the Cybersecurity Resource Center. The first due date for affirmative action covered entities have to take, unless they've had a cybersecurity incident this December, is about six months from now. As has been required every year since 2017, covered entities will have to submit an annual notification regarding their compliance with the cybersecurity regulation during the previous year. The submission should be made the same way covered entities have always made these submissions through the DFS portal. But there is a difference between what will be required next April 15th, 2024, and what has previously been required by April 15th of every other year. In the 2017 version, covered entities were required to submit written statements certifying their full compliance with Part 500 during the prior calendar year. And those statements had to be signed by the chair of the board or the senior officer in charge of cybersecurity. But in 2024, covered entities will have the option to submit either a certification that they have materially complied with the requirements of Part 500 during the prior calendar year, or an acknowledgement of non-compliance, which acknowledges that the covered entity did not materially comply with all the requirements of Part 500 during the previous year, identifies all sections of Part 500 that the covered entity has not complied with, and provides a remediation timeline or confirmation that remediation is complete. No matter which submission a covered entity makes, it will now have to be signed by both the highest ranking executive at the covered entity and its CISO, or the senior officer in charge of cybersecurity if the covered entity does not have a CISO. For individuals, this can be the same person. We've gotten a lot of questions about what people have to certify uh, for in April 2024. Um, so I'm going to repeat to you that you only need to determine your compliance with the sections of Part 500 that are effective as of April 15th, 2024, which are the requirements of Part 500 as the regulation read prior to November 1st, and if you suffered a cybersecurity event this December, the new cybersecurity incident notification requirements in 517A. Again, if a covered entity did not suffer a cybersecurity incident this December 2023, 
That covered entity does not need to determine whether it materially complied with any of the new requirements in the amended regulation during the previous calendar year. If a covered entity during 2023 has determined it was not in material compliance with the requirements of Part 500, as the regulation read prior to November 1st, 2023, it must submit an acknowledgement of non-compliance. DFS decided to allow covered entities to follow to file acknowledgements of non-compliance in response to an issue raised by industry that there was not an option to submit anything if a covered entity could not certify that it had been fully compliant during the previous calendar year. To the extent anyone is wondering about DFS's approach to cybersecurity enforcement, given the changes in the amendment, I'll share these observations. Section 520 lists the factors that DFS must use to assess a penalty for violating the regulation. A list that is consistent with the factors DFS applies in all pen penalty contexts, not just cybersecurity, and a list that is consistent with what DFS has been considering in penalties for cybersecurity regulations since the regulation was promulgated. The amended regulation is intended to clarify and improve transparency with respect to DFS's approach to enforcement in cybersecurity matters, but the agency's overall approach remains consistent. Our overall approach to enforcement, as I have said, has not changed. DFS has resolved multiple enforcement actions each year that involve cybersecurity, which, speaking of transparency, are posted on DFS's Cybersecurity Resource Center under industry guidance. A review of those will make clear that DFS takes action when a licensee significantly fails to meet its obligations under Part 500 to secure the data of its company and customers. For these submissions, you only need to determine your compliance with the sections that are effective as of April 15th, 2024, like I've said. And that means that if you are now entitled to an exemption, you only need to, to determine your compliance with the sections that are applicable to you based on the exemption you now qualify for. Um, no matter which submission a covered entity makes, as we've said, it will have to be signed by the highest ranking executive of the covered entity and its CISO or the senior officer in charge of cybersecurity if the covered entity does not have a CISO. The highest ranking executive is the most senior executive responsible for the overall operation and management of the covered entity. In general, for purposes of the Part 500 certification or acknowledgement, the highest ranking executive for a functional area, such as human resources, finance, IT, will not be the overall highest ranking executive. Um, however, if the highest ranking executive for a functional area is also the person responsible for the overall operation and management of the covered entity, then they could be the appropriate signatory. If the covered entity is a shell company, then the highest ranking executive at the parent must attest to the covered entity's compliance. Again, detailed directions for making these submissions will be posted on the Cybersecurity Resource Center on or around January, 20, January 1st, 2024, which is the first day you will be able to submit certifications or acknowledgement. As has always been the case, submissions can be made each year from January 1st through April 15th and can be submitted by someone other than the signatories themselves. While two people must attest to the covered entity's compliance during the previous calendar year, both can be submitted at the same time, on the same form, in the DFS portal. Please note, however, that Section 517B3 requires covered entities to keep relevant documentation and information regarding that submission for five years, which means that documents evidencing that both signatories reviewed the materials specified in Section 517B and that they approved the certification or acknowledgement. About six months from now, as you heard before, the requirements regarding risk assessments will change. Next slide, please. Um, but before we start talking about them, let's just take a step back and talk about the cybersecurity regulation generally. Its basic requirement 
is that a covered entity have a cybersecurity program designed to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of a covered entity's information systems and the non-public information stored on them. Since the purpose of the programs are to protect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability, it's important that you understand what each of those are. Confidentiality means that information is not made available or disclosed to unauthorized individuals, entities, or processes. Measures taken to ensure confidentiality prevent sensitive information from reaching the wrong hands. Integrity means that data has not been altered or destroyed from its intended form or content. Measures taken to ensure integrity preserve the accuracy and trustworthiness of the information. Availability means that information is operational, accessible, functional, and usable upon demand by an authorized system or user. Information must be available when needed. How does a covered entity go about developing these programs? By starting with a risk assessment and building the program around and based on the covered entity's specific risks, which depend on size, business model, data maintained, and so forth. In other words, risk assessments are the heart and driver of a covered entity's cybersecurity program under New York cybersecurity regulation. Harriet mentioned something at the beginning that is worth repeating here. The amendment maintains Part 500's risk-based approach and continues to require covered entities to design a comprehensive cybersecurity program that addresses their particular risks. In the 2017 version of the regulation, covered entities were required to conduct risk assessments periodically. Starting on April 29, 2024, risk assessments will have to be reviewed and updated at least annually, and whenever a change in the business or technology causes a material change to the business's cyber risk. The other difference between the 2017 and amended versions is that the 2017 version defined risk assessments as those that each covered entity is required to conduct under Section 500.9. However, Given the enormous importance of risk assessments, the amended version revised the definition to more clearly explain what a risk assessment is. It is the process of identifying, estimating, and prioritizing cybersecurity risks to organizational operations, including mission, functions, image, and reputation, organizational assets, individuals, customers, consumers, other organizations, and critical infrastructure resulting from the operation of an information system. Risk assessments incorporate threat and vulnerability analyses and consider mitigations provided by cybersecurity controls planned or in place. So the risk assessment process is a component of an organization's overall risk management strategy, and it should be conducted in a way that reflects the company's mission, values, and objectives. Next slide, please. After assessing risks, senior management must review, update if necessary, and approve cybersecurity policies. That has to be done by senior management every year. Next slide, please. Again, the requirement to maintain and implement cybersecurity policies has been around since the regulation was first promulgated. The policies have to address the following areas, and they have always had to address these areas information security, data privacy, risk assessments, data governance and classifications, asset inventory and device management, vendor and third-party service provider management, business continuity, disaster recovery and incident response, systems operations and availability, network security, monitoring, application development and quality assurance, access and identity management, is and physical security and environmental controls. Now we've received a number of questions about environmental controls. These are controls that protect your assets from accidental, intentional, and natural events, such as fire and water damage and power disruption. For example, if you have a server room, you have to ensure it is not too hot or too dry because of the risk of static electricity or wet. So you probably want to ensure fire detectors and humidity and flood sensors are in place. As of April 29th, 2024, 
the policies are going to have to address the following additional areas. Data retention, end of life management, which is phasing out unsupported technical products, remote access controls, systems and network monitoring, security awareness and training, systems and application security, incident notification and vulnerability management. Maintaining comprehensive cybersecurity policies is imperative for ensuring robust cybersecurity across all facets of a covered entity's operations. The other new requirement is that covered entities must develop, document, and implement procedures in accordance with their written policies. The final key change that will be explained in detail today has to do with MFA requirements. What is MFA? Multi-factor authentication. It's a way to ensure the user is who they claim to be. In other words, to confirm a user's identity. MFA is widely believed to be one of the most, if not the most, cost-effective ways to reduce cyber risk. It is used both to prevent initial unauthorized access to information systems and, if a system does get breached, to prevent or mitigate the spread of an attack. With MFA, a user must authenticate their identity by supplying at least two of the following. A knowledge factor, which is something the user knows, such as a password or passphrase. An adherence factor, something the user is, such as a fingerprint. A possession factor, something the user the user has, such as a device, a mobile phone, or a laptop, for example. Please note that when authenticating to a device, for example, logging into a laptop, the device itself does not qualify as a possession factor for gaining access to that device for purposes of the MFA requirements of Section 512. A device could qualify as a possession factor if it has code-based apps or hardware keys um, but it has to have something other than just the device itself. Next slide, please. Currently, standard and Class A covered entities are required to use MFA or another type of risk-based authentication to protect unauthorized access to non-public information or information systems. And for individuals accessing the covered entity's internal network from an external network, unless the covered entities CISO has approved the use of reasonably equivalent or more secure access controls. Small businesses that qualify for a limited exemption are currently not required by the regulation explicitly to use MFA, although many of them already do. The amended regulation as of November 1st, 2024, that's one year from now, will require those small businesses to use MFA for remote access to their information systems, remote access to third party applications from which non public information is accessible, and all privileged accounts. As of November 1st, 2025, two years from now, standard and Class A companies will be required to use MFA for any individual accessing any information system. This aligns with the Federal Trade Commission's safeguards rule. The only exceptions DFS will permit for the Class A and standard and small businesses um, are those approved by a CISO because other reasonably equivalent or more secure compensating controls are in place. However, if a small business does not have a CISO, it cannot uh, use any other compensating controls. You must have a CISO and the CISO must approve other reasonably equivalent or more secure compensating controls to um, not use MFA for what's required under the regulation. And now I'm gonna hand it back to Harriet to finish us off. Thank you, Joanne, for the comprehensive overview of the changes to Part 500. And now, as we um, come to the last portion of this session, I'd like to highlight, again, a couple of the resources that DFS is making available to support covered entities in their work on um, compliance with the cybersecurity regulation. 
Um, the best place to start uh, in uh, looking at this area is the cyber what, what the online uh, site that we call the Cybersecurity Resource Center, which is available on DFS's website. Uh, it has several resources on the amended regulation for businesses of all sizes, including uh, posted uh, a copy of the full regulation, uh, tailored timelines for uh, compliance dates uh, for the three types of covered entities that Joanne described. Um, there are uh, Q&As or FAQs uh, on a number of topics. Um, there are filing and reporting instructions that have been or are about to be updated to reflect the new requirements as they phase in. Um, there are some focused area uh, in support of small businesses who are working to comply with the changed re regulation. So uh, a number of resources available right now on that site. And in addition, we plan to have additional information posted, including some short, easy to follow uh, training videos on specific topics and uh, more um, opportunities to uh, have uh, sessions like this going forward on specific topics as the dates kick in. Um, also, as was mentioned earlier, if we go to the next slide and um, the final slide, uh, I'd encourage you, if you are uh, representing and working with a covered entity interested in the cybersecurity regulation, uh, please sign up for uh, updates from uh, DFS on the regulation and cybersecurity issues. Um, we will, uh, we have sent out and we will continue sending out email updates ahead of each of the key implementation dates. Um, and it's easy to sign up. Um, we won't share your email address and uh, we, uh, it, it's easy enough to, to do this. Um, I, I, in addition, if you have additional questions, uh, there were a number submitted in advance and our presentation today tried to address most of them. If you have a, a follow-up question, a specific question, we will do our best to direct you to resources, uh, including attempting to answer questions that we, we can answer. Um, just send an email to the address that's identified on the screen, which is cyberregsupport at dfs.ny.gov. With that, um, again, thank you, Joanne, for the overview. Uh, thank you to all of you for investing time uh, here on this session. We appreciate uh, your uh, attending, and we hope this has been helpful. Thank you very much.